Amen. Some of you are wondering why we have a video about peace when it's the first Sunday of Advent. That's going to be explained in a little bit, um, but you'll have to bear with us until then. So have you been listening to Christmas carols on the radio? You enjoy that? Some of you started in November 1st. I know you did. In our house, we just started, uh, we put on a Christmas playlist for the first time this year, uh, a little bit earlier, I think it was December the 1st. That's kind of when Christmas starts in our house. Um, and so we listen to some carols now. One of the carols that I just recently heard was Old Little Town of Bethlehem. Uh, we haven't sung that. We're not going to sing that today. We'll sing it another day, I'm sure. But uh, you know the lyrics are, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. O Little Town of Bethlehem was composed by Reverend Phillips Brooks. It was during a trip to the Holy Land in 1865, a long time ago, that Reverend Brooks went to the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem on Christmas Eve and worshipped there. And it was a profound, still, peaceful night, a wonderful night, and he was deeply moved by that experience. And when he got home to Philadelphia, at some point later on, he wanted the, the children of his church to sing a special Christmas carol. And so he recalled that peaceful time of worship that he had in Bethlehem, and he wrote down the lyrics to the song in a single night. He gave the copy of the text to his organist, Louis Redner, and requested them to compose a melody that would be easy for the children to sing. And, and the result is the hymn that we know today as O Little Town of Bethlehem. And the lyrics of that song stir up, in me at least, and perhaps in you also, stir up images of peacefulness and stillness, of, of anticipation of the joy that's going to come in the wee hours of the early morning. It's a wonderful Christmas carol that invokes the best of Christmas Eve. All the best things that we wish Christmas will be. All the things we hope Christmas will be. All the things that we expect Bethlehem was that first Christmas Eve. And we forget that the night that the song refers to, that first Christmas Eve, Bethlehem was under Roman occupation. We forget that at the time, the town was ruled by a fellow named Herod, who was a violent tyrant of a man who would think nothing of shortly ordering the massacre of the innocents, the violent death of every in, uh, male baby, every male toddler, everyone under the age of three. Put the, he, he had soldiers run through and knife them all to death in front of their parents, just in case one of them might rise up and grow up and become a threat to his regime. That was... Bethlehem in those days. And for sure, Bethlehem must have been still and peaceful one wonderful evening. But in reality, Bethlehem was a place of groans, a place of suffering, a place of grief. And to this place came Messiah. To this place comes Messiah because the Lord comes to His people when they are most in need of Him. Glory to God. And to that point, and before we go any further, let's seek his face in prayer as we begin the message today. Father, you know that some of us here in this congregation, some who are watching online, are in a place of great need, a place of grief, a place of suffering, a place of loss. How they need you, O oh Lord God. How we all need you. How we all need you, Father. We open the newspapers and we see all that's happening in the world and the chaos and the wars that are going on. And Father, we say, Lord, we need you. Come, Lord Jesus. Come to your people. So, Father, you ask that we would prepare ourselves. And as we prepare ourselves through this message, in this Advent season, we pray that you would visit upon us in a, in a powerful, powerful way. We, we pray, pray, Father God, God, that you would take what is spoken here, the words that you've given to me for this congregation, for this season, for this year. Apply them to the context of who we are as individuals. Father, that we might have more of your peace. Have more of your kingdom. And look more like Jesus than we ever have before. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we continue in our Advent series, uh, we're looking at the promised Savior, and we're digging into Old Testament prophecies of Messiah's arrival. 
Last week we studied Genesis 49. We went back into our previous series called Living the Dream, which was a look at the the story of Joseph, and we saw that the hope of Messiah comes through Judah's lineage in a prophecy that Jacob, Joseph's father, gave to Joseph's brother Judah. And we saw how Christmas, how, uh, how the arrival of Jesus Christ fulfilled that hope, how the prophecy given to Judah, who was really nothing more than any of us, he was just a repentant sinner, and we kind of looked into his life a little bit. We saw how those prophecies were fulfilled to his very great benefit and to our very great encouragement and blessing. Judah was the promised line. Today we look at the promised place, the promise that the Lord gives to Bethlehem, that the promise that this unlikely place would become the birthplace of Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a promise I'm sure that you're all familiar with. A promise you look forward to reading each Christmas. A promise that fills you with the warmth and the love of beloved Christmas carols like O Little Town of Bethlehem. So turn with me now in your Bibles, or navigate in the device as the case may be, to the book of Micah. Now Micah is an Old Testament prophet. He's one of the minor prophets. You may know that the books of the Bible are divided up into groups. In the Old Testament, there's the historical books first, starting with the law, the first five books of Moses, including Judges, going all the way up to Esther. And then there's the poetic books that come after uh, the, the historical books, the books of Job and Psalms, the books and the three books of Solomon. Then there's the books of prophecy, and the books of prophecy start with the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Of course, Jeremiah also wrote the book of Lamentations. And it continues with 12 minor prophets, beginning with Daniel, continuing to Malachi, and the close of the Old Testament. And the book of Micah is one of those minor prophets. The book of Micah comes after Jonah and before Nahum. It's in the middle of the minor prophet section, almost at the end of the Old Testament. That's the biblical context in which we find this prophecy. The scriptural context is that Micah, uh, the prophet Micah, was a contemporary of Isaiah. The major prophet Isaiah and the minor prophet Micah overlap in both time and in ministry. And we know that because the book of Isaiah begins uh, with this word. It says, the vision of of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotim, Ahaz, and Hezekiah kings of Judah. And the book of Micah begins much the same way. It says the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morseth in the days of Jotun, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. And from that we can understand that both Isaiah and Micah were prophesying during these later three kings of Judah. But while Isaiah preached primarily in the capital city of Jerusalem, Micah preached primarily in the countryside of Judah. Imagine Isaiah as someone speaking and ministering in downtown Kingston, and Micah as someone saying almost the same things, but in Frontenac County, perhaps in Glen Burnie or Odessa or Inverary. And like Isaiah, Micah preaches of the pending arrival of God. The arrival of God that will be for all God's obedient people a time of great gladness. Praise the Lord. But for the disobedient, the arrival of God will be a time of gloom. A gloom and distress because God is coming to judge the disobedient for their idolatry and for their callous disregard of His name. And before you celebrate that saying, oh good, all my enemies will be destroyed, you've got to remember that Micah preached to God's people to the people of Judah. Why? Because God's judgment always starts with God's people. God's judgment always starts with God's people. And so Micah begins with this. He says, look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads the high places of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him. The valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. All this, Micah says, all this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the house of Israel. And over the next seven chapters, Micah lays out both God's charges against Israel 
and the Lord's coming judgment on account of those very charges. It's a book of fire and brimstone preaching. And Micah says such things as this. He says, woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light they carried out because it is in their power to do so. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They defraud a man of his home, a fellow man of his inheritance. Therefore, the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity. In that day, men will ridicule you. They will taunt you with this mournful song. We are utterly ruined. My people's possession is divided up. He takes it from me. He assigns our fields to traitors. Wow. The book is packed with that. And that's a timely message even for today because God is saying through the prophet Micah that you cannot create homelessness and a housing crisis to your own prophet and expect to get away with it. God is judge. And that's just one point. One point in one paragraph in a single chapter in a book of seven chapters packed with material like that. Micah speaks against much injustice. Much injustice that God's people were not just tolerating, but participating in. And on account of such wickedness, the prophet was sent to the people of Judah to prophesy the gloom of coming judgment before God's imminent arrival. In this context, we have to realize, even before we get to the prophecy of Messiah, all the gladness that Micah preached of God's plan of redemption through Messiah, through the coming king, comes to us in the midst of trouble, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of difficulty and suffering. The light of Christ shines in the dark, as it were. And this is the textual context that he writes of Messiah, born for us in this particular place from the line of Judah. And I want you to start off then with the biblical context, the scriptural context, and the textual context before we flip over then to Micah chapter 5. We need to have that context before we look at this prophecy because the tendency is to open to Micah 5, zero in on verse 2, and forget the context that this is coming in. But the context is key. It's critical to understanding the promise. I want you to understand that. The context is critical to understanding the promise. And so I'm going to read, now that we have the context, the study passage from the book of Micah today. And after I've read the passage, we're going to dig into each line and discover how the context allows us to see the truth of Jesus in astonishing clarity and how God it also allows us to see the application of this truth in astonishing clarity. Micah writes, This is Micah 5, starting in verse 1. Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers rejoin to return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. In the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, they will live securely for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth and he will be their peace. Amen. Now, I know last week's message looked forward to the hope that we have in Advent in Messiah. This week, we're going to begin looking at the peace that Jesus brings on his arrival. Peace in the midst of chaos. And someone's going to say, Marcus, you've got this all messed up. This is supposed to be the week of hope, not the week of peace. You're supposed to preach on hope this week, but you preached on it last week. You forget that this whole series is a series on prophecy. Prophecy comes before. It's always ahead of the curve, as it will. It comes in advance. And so, by God's design, it seems somewhat fitting that the week we look and light the hope candle, we begin looking to Christ our peace. 
Let's consider verse 1 then of chapter 5 here. Micah writes and prophesies of a time of war for Jerusalem. The city of troops is Jerusalem, the capital city. And this was going to be a war where the capital city was be under siege and a war that Israel would lose. It will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. And you know, that's exactly what came to pass. That's exactly what happened. And not in Micah's day, mind you. I want us to understand that. Micah is prophesying this. This comes after the prophecy. Remember that Micah preached during the days of Jotim, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And it's true that during Hezekiah's reign, the king of Assyria did, in fact, march up to Jerusalem to take it and even began a siege. And 2 Kings 18 tells us, though, that in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, and I'm going to mispronounce a lot of names today, just heads up, okay? So you can giggle to yourself because I have a terrible time with some of these biblical names. The king of Assyria attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them, it says, 2 Kings 18. Fortunately for those living in that day, in Micah's day, when, when the king of Assyria got to Jerusalem, Hezekiah wisely sought the counsel of the prophet of the Lord, the prophet living in Jerusalem, and that is the city prophet, Isaiah. And so having consulted Isaiah, Hezekiah sought the Lord, and subsequently, because Hezekiah sought the Lord, the king of Assyria withdrew. He withdrew because in God's providence, just right then, his own empire came under attack by the Babylonians. And so hearing of this news, back in his home country, he goes, oh, I can't fight this, I've got to go fight that battle. And so he leaves, and the city of Jerusalem got spared in Hezekiah's day, in Micah's day. Praise the Lord. But you know, after Hezekiah came other kings, only one of which, Hezekiah's grandson Josiah, only one of which did right in the eyes of the Lord as Hezekiah had done. All the rest of Judah's final kings did not. And subsequently, in the providence of God, in time, the Babylonian Empire defeated the Assyrians and marched against Jerusalem. And this time they did take it. 2 Kings 24 says, tells us that. It says, at that time, the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, advanced on Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And Nebuchadnezzar himself came up to the city while his officers were besieging it. Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his mother, his attendants, his nobles, and all his officials surrendered to him. In the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon, he took Jehoiakim the king prisoner. And Nebuchadnezzar took the king of Judah, captive to Babylon. He made uh, Jehoiakim's uncle king in his place, and he changed Jehoiakim's uncle's name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was a puppet king. He was a ruler only by the grace of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And for a while, Zedekiah played along with that because it allowed him certain privileges, you know, to be king even as a puppet you know, just like Herod was a puppet of Rome, well, it still affords you some privileges. It still allows you to govern to some degree. But Zedekiah didn't like those strings that were attached to him. And in spite of several severe warnings, in spite of all that Isaiah wrote prior, all that Micah wrote prior, and in spite of severe warnings by the prophet of his day, which was Jeremiah, another one of the major prophets, that, that any rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar is going to fail and be the downfall of all, in spite of all of that, Zedekiah chose foolishly. He chose not to listen to the Lord. And the record goes on to say, now Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. He encamped outside the city and built siege works all around it. The city was kept under siege until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. And that year, which scholars tell us was 586 B.C., that year the city of Jerusalem fell. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took the city. And in judgment of the Zedekiah's rebellion, Nebuchadnezzar had Zedekiah watch his sons killed right in front of him and then had Zedekiah beaten with rods so severely that he went permanently blind. 
And Zedekiah was bound in shackles and dragged off to Babylon, where he died in imprisonment and pain and poverty. Now we're just one verse into our study passage here, but let us already gain this much then. That heeding God's word always, uh, that not heeding God's word always leads to a horrible end. Not listening to the Lord leads to an end without redemption. But praise God, heeding his word, listening to God's word, as as Hezekiah did, always leads to blessing. Not heeding God's word leads to disaster. Heeding God's word leads to blessing. It leads to redemption. Because if you heed God's word, you will either find the prophecy against you postponed, or in the case of prophecy fulfilled, it becomes prophecy fulfilled to your very great benefit. To your benefit. But ignoring God's word always results in disaster. I want us to hear that. Ignoring God's word always results in disaster. It results in an end without redemption. And Hezekiah, in his day, understood that. He understood that. He heeded prophecy. He avoided disaster. The judgment on Judah got postponed. And his great-grandson, Josiah, also understood that. He also heeded prophecy. He also avoided disaster. And the judgment got postponed yet again. But the kings who came after Josiah did not. And eventually, Zedekiah found himself fulfilling prophecy in the worst way possible. Because this is truth, friends. You're either going to fulfill prophecy in obedience, or you're going to do as Zedekiah did and fulfill prophecy in disobedience. Friends, don't be like Zedekiah. Don't be like Zedekiah. It was a disaster for him. By the way, did you know that Zedekiah was the last king of Judah? The last king of the last part of Israel to fall. And that's why it was so significant that when Christ came, they crowned him king of the Jews. Christ picked up where Zedekiah left off. And it's interesting too then that Zedekiah, that Christ also was beaten with a rod, just as the previous king had been. Because Christ picked up where Zedekiah left off. Matthew writes that when the Roman soldiers were tormenting Jesus, they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. Jesus fulfilled Micah's prophecy also. But I want us to see this. Unlike Zedekiah, Christ was obedient. Christ was sinless. He he was obedient to God the Father without fault. And therefore, the prophecy that Jesus endured was redeemed. It was redeemed. Peter writes, when they hurled their insults at him, at Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges rightly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you are healed. By his wounds you are healed. Jesus' suffering was not without redemption. He was raised from the dead himself. He ever lives at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, in glory. But his suffering became the redemption, not just for himself, but, but redemption for all of us. The means of our redemption, the means of our healing and glory to God for the joy set before Him, Jesus endured the cross. For the joy set before Him, Jesus fulfilled prophecy in obedience. Not as Zedekiah had done who fulfilled prophecy in disobedience. Consider that. Now time is going to fail us. We've got to go on to verse 2 here. Verse 2. And this is really all of that, so to speak, is the context. Here we now get to the meat of it. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me. You might want to underline that if you have a paper bottle. Will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And this, verse 2 here, is the beloved prophecy of Bethlehem. The prophecy that all 
God's people then look back on. It's the prophecy that New Testament Scripture says was fulfilled by Jesus Christ to the letter. Matthew 2 says, When he, that's Herod, had called together all the chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where Christ would be born. And they answer very confidently. They say, In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. And then they quote Micah 2, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people Israel. Amen. The story of God with us, the story of Emmanuel, of God living among his creation, begins in Bethlehem, just as it was prophesied. Now, I often wonder, why, Lord, why, why Bethlehem? I mean, there's lots of places in Judah. There's lots of places in Israel. Why that particular place? Of all the places you could pick, why, why that place? Why didn't you pick some other place? Why didn't you pick Capernaum, where Jesus would base his ministry? Why didn't you pick Jerusalem, the capital city? Why that place? Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that the first time we read of Bethlehem, we read of it in Genesis. It's actually part of the story, if you will, of Jacob, father of Joseph. You may recall from our last series on Joseph that Jacob had worked for his uncle Laban for seven years to earn the hand of, uh, J- of Laban's daughter Rachel in marriage. Now, Jacob wound up with four wives, but he only sought this first one. And he really only ever loved that first one, Rachel. Through his wives, Jacob had 12 sons, but Rachel only bore Jacob two of those sons. The first was Joseph. And many, many years later, Rachel gave birth to Benjamin. Genesis 35 tells us the story. It says, Then Jacob and his family moved on from Bethel. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Onai, but his father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. Friends, I want us to understand this. Bethlehem as a place did not exist until Rachel died. Until Rachel died. Prior to her death, that place was just a point, a random point along the road to Ephrath, the place they were going. But when she died, her burial site became known as Bethlehem because the pillar that Jacob set up would become a mile marker. And on the way to Ephrath, you're going to come across this pillar. Everybody talks about the pillar on the way to Ephrath. And it's not far from Ephrath. It's it's not far from that place. And so it becomes a stopping place. And the stopping place becomes a town. And we we can know then that Bethlehem was born in tears. Bethlehem as a place was born in tears. It was a place of suffering. It was a place of loss. It was a place of grief. And at the same time, as it was born in tears and suffering and grief and Rachel's death, it was also a place of redemption because it was there that Benjamin was born at that exact moment. At that exact moment as Rachel died, a son was given. Praise the Lord. And these intertwined ideas of of suffering and grief and loss and redemption, these twin themes that mark the life of Jesus Christ marked Bethlehem from the start, from the very beginning. And maybe that's a clue as to why the Lord chose that particular place. There were other clues. Did you know that Bethlehem's story includes one of Israel's judges? After Moses, after Joshua, during the time of the judges, when Israel had no king, Ibzan of Bethlehem led Israel. Scripture tells us that he was a very unusual judge because it says he had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave his daughters away in marriage. Underline this again in your Bibles if you have one. 
uh, to those outside his clan. To those outside his clan. To include others in his family. And for his sons he brought in 30 young women as wives from outside his clan. Ibsen left led Israel seven years, then Ibsen died and was buried in Bethlehem. And that doesn't tell us a whole lot, but it tells us something. It tells us that Bethlehem was a place of deliverance because a judge rose from there. And it tells us that Bethlehem became a place of blessing for others, outsiders, if you will. Bethlehem's story also includes the story of Ruth the Moabitess. Ruth married one of Naomi's sons. Naomi was a Hebrew and or was a Moabitess, or was from Moab, and she married uh, the son of Bethlehem. Ruth wound up traveling to Bethlehem after her husband died, and the book bearing her name tells us how Ruth met Boaz of Bethlehem, who redeemed Naomi's inheritance. Sorry, Naomi was, in fact, a Hebrew. And Boaz redeemed Naomi's inheritance, and that's something. It tells us again that Bethlehem is a place of redemption. And through Ruth, Boaz becomes the great-grandfather of King David, who led a united Israel to victory over all their enemies. Now, these are just clues. We don't know the full reason. God doesn't tell us the full reasoning, and it's undoubtedly far beyond our understanding. We don't know exactly why he chose this place, but we certainly have a clue here in knowing that the story of Bethlehem is the story of suffering, but also the story of blessing, also the story of redemption, also the story of deliverance. And all of it points to Jesus Christ, our Deliverer. Points to Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus Christ who redeems us. Jesus Christ who is born in Bethlehem in answer to prophecy. Now you know the prophecy that Micah gives us doesn't end in verse 2. He goes on to say that Israel will not have leadership until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers rejoin return to join the Israelites. Look at that phrase, until the time when she was in labor gives birth. And hearing that, one might think to recall Rachel's story, but it's talking of a time in the future. It's looking forward to Mary. And at the same time, it reminds us of the gap between Zedekiah, the last king of the Judah, and Jesus, the last king, king of the Jews. And isn't it interesting that since Jesus, Israel has not had a king. Since Jesus, Israel hasn't had a king. Not at all. And someone's going to point out, yes, Marcus, but they had Matthias of Ho uh, the Hasmonean, and they had his son Judah Maccabee, and Judah's brother Jonathan, and Jonathan's son Simeon. But none of the Maccabees were kings. They were actually priests. And Israel remains without a king. Since 1948, they've been led by a prime minister not by a king. And this is truth, friends. Israel will not have a king until Christ returns with all his brothers and sisters, with all the church, and Israel, the family of God by faith, will be made complete. That's when Israel will once again have a king. Just as Paul said, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not, may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel, meaning spiritual Israel, all who have faith in, Christ, in, in the Lord will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. Praise the Lord. And so Micah's prophecy then has been fulfilled in part by Christ's first advent and it will be fulfilled in completion by his second advent just as the prophecy of Jacob that we looked at last week. And the rest of Micah's prophecy, likewise. At Jesus' first coming, Jesus stood and shepherded his flock in the strength of the Lord. He spoke and ministered peace to all. And even now, is not Christ our shepherd? He certainly is. And today, Christ our shepherd rules and guides us in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord. By his word and by his spirit, he yet leads his people in strength. Praise the Lord. He is even today our peace. In fact, the New Testament specifically tells us that in black and white text in Ephesians. It says, for he himself, meaning Jesus, is our peace, who has made both Jew and Gentile into one church, has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. 
And consequently, we are no longer foreigners and aliens to the people of God, but we are now fellow citizens with God's people, members of God's household. That's why the blessing of Abraham has come to us. And praise the Lord, we enjoy all of this because Jesus fulfilled prophecy in obedience. Because Jesus fulfilled prophecy in obedience. We have this great blessing, and we can know that on a future day, on that coming great day, Christ will be peace for all. On that day, his greatness will truly reach the ends of the earth, and every knee will bow to him, and every tongue will confess to him. Romans 14, Romans 11, verse 14. As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So when Christ comes back in power and great glory, there will be peace, my friend. On that day, peace here in Canada, peace in the Middle East, peace in Jerusalem, peace in Gaza, peace in Ukraine, and peace in Russia. Glory to God. Everything that Micah said about Messiah, everything he prophesied, has come to pass in Jesus and will come to pass in Christ our Lord. All as a direct result. We can know all these things because of the prophecy of Micah. And God has given this to us today, friends, that we might apply it that we might apply it. So let's draw the application out then in some great clarity. Two points. The first one is that we must always live in obedience. Why? Because, friends, we do not know when prophecy will be fulfilled. And Christ is coming again. The lasting king of Judah is coming again, and we don't know when. Until Christ comes back, we must be found to be living in obedience. We want to be like Jesus, the lasting king of Judah, not like Zedekiah, the last king of Judah. Amen? Amen. When all that Micah wrote wraps up, you don't want to be found in disobedience. When you see him in the sky and you're not living rightly, that's a problem, my friends. If you, if you look upon his face and you're not walking in right relationship with him, it's not going to go well with you. And that's perhaps the greatest of all understatements. That's the first point. Don't be like Zedekiah. Walk in obedience and be ready for the fulfillment of prophecy that we might be part of that in obedience. Praise the Lord. That's a reflection of last week's message. Enter Advent in right relationship with God because God is coming back. Second point. Right now, you can open the newspaper you can turn on the radio and you can know that all around us is disappointment and suffering. And maybe you yourself are right now, even as I preach this, are living in a season of disappointment and suffering. But friends, in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of all the sadness, there is peace, there is hope, there is the presence of Christ our Lord. Because He Himself is our peace. He himself is our peace. It's not that we're waiting for peace anymore because we can find peace in Christ. Read Micah 5 verse 5a again. He is our peace. That's not just a powerful truth from the last part of our study passage. It was and is the whole context of this message. It's the whole context of Bethlehem, the whole context of the birth of Messiah. Which means we don't have to wait for peace because Christ has already come and Christ is already here and Christ will come again. It's beyond, he is beyond time. And therefore, all of us who live in dark times can look to him and have peace in him because he is our peace who made peace for us, peace in the midst of dark times. That's who Jesus is, peace in the midst of dark times. Let every carol this Christmas remind us of that fact, that Jesus is our peace. When we need peace, most of all, He is our peace. How we need to be reminded of that day by day, as long as we live in these days. Let's seal these points up in prayer as we close our service. Father, 
we give you glory and we give you praise, that you sent Christ already, that we live in this in-between time. We don't have to look forward to this, this happening. We live after it's happened and before it will yet happen again. And you give to us the privilege of living in the, between the first advent and the second advent of Christ, Christ who is our hope and Christ who is our peace, Christ who is our everything, our Redeemer, our Savior. Father, we give you glory in this season that we find ourselves. Let us keep our eyes ever upon you, Lord. Let us keep our eyes always upon your word and the truth of your word. Father, guard our hearts that we might walk in obedience and so be found ready on that wonderful day when all at once you are here and we look upon your face. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a worship song and then we're going to have communion. So don't go away.